<laughs> Let me uh, thank Emmanuel for his uh, uh, invitation to be here today. It is a, it is a great pleasure. Um, I can't match Steve, uh, uh, Steve's presentation and Michael's. I uh, can't match the uh, models. So uh, let me make up for it with a couple of jokes. Um, first one is about a guy who's lost on small roads in Ireland. And he wants to get to Dublin. And he's totally lost. And he sees an old man in the field. And the old man, uh, he says to the old man, Sir, how can I get to Dublin? And the old man responds, Well, sir, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> and the second joke, um, and this may be the last funny thing you'll get from me today. Um, guy jumps out of the 22nd story window. And as he goes past the second story, uh, someone shouts out, how are you doing? He says, so far, so good. Well, both of those jokes have something to say about uh, what I wish to say. Um, things look pretty good at the moment. I actually think that the outlook is quite dire. I have a very black view on what comes next. Um, and I also want to suggest that the blackness of my view, that the situation that we're in is conditioned by the structure of the system that we've got. So in a sense, the two parts of my presentation about the economic outlook, it doesn't look so good, and it is because of the system that we have. We're making a prima facie case for it's worth thinking about doing things differently and having systemic reform. Now, Michael uh, suggested at the beginning of our day that uh, everything that you have learned about monetary economics is wrong. Um, frankly, the thing that surprises me, because my first bank was at, my first job was at the Bank of England from 1969 to 1972, is that much of what Michael had to say was common knowledge in those days. Right? The banks create, cre create money by writing up credit to both sides of the balance sheet. So anyway, uh, I totally agree with him on that. Much of what you've been taught is wrong, but I actually want to extend it by suggesting that most of what you've learned about macroeconomics is wrong. And I think a macro made a mistake about 100 years ago, uh, fundamental, someone used the word philosophical earlier on, a fundamental ontological mistake, that we started off by assuming that the economy is actually kind of like a machine. It's, it's understandable and it's controllable. And I guess my contention would be, even before I begin here, that this is a million miles from the truth, that the economy is not understandable and controllable. It is not a machine. It is a complex, adaptive system, an evolutionary system, like so many things that we see both in nature and in society. Why should the economy somehow be a unique thing that is comprehensible and controllable? Uh, that's the thing that sort of really sticks in, sticks in my craw. And the question was raised earlier on was, how did we get onto this wrong path, analytical path, and why has it persisted for so long? And maybe if I've got enough time, I'll, I'll get to some of that right at the end of, of what I have to say. But one of the things about these complex systems is that they're all time dependent. So you can't really understand where you're going right, until you understand where you are and you can't understand where you are until you understand where you've been. So let me just take a few slides <clears throat> to run through all of where we are, where we've been, where we are, where we're going, why it's a sort of dire possible outcome, and what some of the alternatives might be. And I will suggest in my penultimate slide, I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, that there are reforms that you can think of to the current system. Okay? We do not necessarily need radical reform, but it is also possible that those twink tweaks to the current system might not be adequate, and that we will need more fundamental reform, and therefore it's very useful to have conferences like this to start thinking about what people might earlier have, have said was the unthinkable. So I think it's a very worthwhile exercise to be getting on with this. 
Well, let me, let me talk about the past. Um, public policy in the lead up to the crisis of 2007. Uh, first point I want to make is if anybody taught economic history or the history of, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been running into a throat problem here, or the history of economic thought, they'd realize that the kind of crises that we've just gone through are absolutely typical. We've seen these kinds of things since time immemorial. And when we think about this particular crisis, um, I guess what I would say, all of these crises begin with, new, with good news, okay? In this credit-based fiat money system, they all begin with good news. The good news this time, I think, was demographics, the baby boom going through, the fall of the wall, and basically what that did was put an enormous positive supply shock into the economy, and the upshot was that there was a strong disinflationary kind of, kind of process. And that, that was sort of the good news. But as always in these fiat money systems, <clears throat> as Chairman Greenspan put it, it's so easy for the rational exuberance to turn into irrational exuberance. And that's precisely what we had in the, the AMEs, which is the advanced market economies. And as that irrational exuberance started to mount, I think there was totally inadequate resistance uh, by fiscal, monetary, and, and regulatory policies. In fact, monetary policy, in the face of all of this disinflationary push, central banks with the emphasis on price stability actually found themselves in a situation where they weren't trying to keep inflation down, they were doing everything they possibly could to get inflation up, which is sort of odd from a prima facie perspective, but that's basically what they did. And regulatory policies, too, leading up to the 2007, you know, in the same sort of way as DSG says, don't worry about macro instability because everything goes back to equilibrium, okay? Don't worry about it. The financial people were basically saying the financial markets are efficient. Uh, they'll sort it all out. We don't need all of this regulation. Get rid of it. So everything, in a certain sense, was going in the, in the wrong direction. And it led to some real and financial imbalances. And in terms of real imbalances, let me just say that the savings rates, household savings rates in all the English-speaking countries went down to close to zero. In the case of New Zealand, minus 20%. Something odd here. Investment in China went up to 40% of GDP. Something odd here. So real side imbalances. And on the financial side, it was the same kind of thing. Think back about 2007 and 2008. Very rapid credit growth. Uh, yield spreads, whether credit yield, term structure, all those spreads went way in. The VIX went to nothing. House prices went through the roof, going back to Steve's stuff. Okay, so we had all sorts of imbalances in 2007, 2008. And then it spread, and that was in the advanced market countries, okay, but particularly the English-speaking ones. But also Europe. Think about imbalances between the peripheral and the core. So we had all of these imbalances. And then they spread to the emerging markets versus semi-fixed exchange rates. So as we were sort of printing the money to get our exchange rates to go down, and we should have been pushing up the, we should have pushed up the exchange rates of the emerging markets, they basically said, if you can print the money without limit to get your currencies down, we can print, the, we can print money without limit to get our currencies up. And that's precisely what they did. And the trigger event for the crisis, of course, was subprime. And in the early days, of course, everybody referred to it as a subprime crisis, the great financial crisis. Um, I think more recently there's been a lot of reflection that indicates that the biggest aspect of the crisis was really the currency mismatch with the European banks having invested huge sums of money, not just in the periphery but in North America, okay, for long-term dollar assets for which they needed short-term dollar financing, which they couldn't get in the middle of the crisis. And that really was, the, that was the, the core of the thing. But in a complex adaptive system, in a certain sense, it doesn't matter where the trigger is. Because the point is, it's the whole system that's become unstable. And you prick it here, you prick it there. If the, if the Fed hadn't given all those swap lines to all the European banks, including the big German ones, 
okay? You would, you would have been the start of the crisis. Europe would have happened before the global crisis, and then the global crisis would have happened afterwards. So the trigger doesn't really matter, but that's how we got to be where we are. Now, the next question is, what have we done since? Well, as you'll recall, um, we, we, what's the word, we took out all the stops, right? We had massive fiscal expansion led by the United States in 2009, all sort of under the umbrella of the G20. Uh, we had um, cars for clunkers to encourage consumption, uh, short time working, and of course, uh, monetary policy did what we all know that it, it did. Uh, there was a very quick recognition, perhaps too quick, of the shortcomings of non-monetary policies. In particular, there was a very quick reversal of fiscal expansion. I personally think in large part because the European crisis allowed the authorities here to convince others that they were all going to be like Greece. So there was a very fast turnaround on the fiscal side. They gave up on all the other stuff. Uh, and regulatory policies, they got immediately, 2009, 2010, regulatory policies went immediately in Basel okay, to making sure this would never happen again. Unfortunately, what they didn't do was resolve the problem that was already out there, and I think we've had a question about that earlier on. The, 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 the banking system problems were never resolved. Okay? in the sense of debts being written off and the people that made the debts being forced to pay a price. It never happened. So we had all of these things that were actually moving in a tightening direction and monetary policy was left as the only game in town. And as you know, um, that monetary policy became increasingly inventive. Okay, so we got the interest rates down to zero, and then it was quantitative easing, qualitative easing, operation twist, forward guidance. Every aspect of the yield curve was being, being pushed down. So in that sense, it was very inventive. But essentially, it was more of the same. And it was more of the same in the sense that monetary policy post-crisis was based on the two fundamental premises that had been driving monetary policy since the 1980s. And that was, one, it will work to stimulate aggregate demand in a reasonably efficient way. And I'll say a word about that right now. But secondly, and this is the next slide, um, it won't have any unintended consequences that you need to worry about. Okay? Well, the first point here, it will work, premise. First point is, it did fail to lift aggregate demand as expected. We are 10 years into it. Last month, the real treasury bill rate went into real territory for the first time in a decade. And yet there are many, many countries, many perhaps represented here today, where GNE in a real terms is not yet back up to pre-crisis levels. And we know from this constant battle to get inflation up that on the nominal front it's been no better. In many countries, they've just got to the point where you could say we're, we're, we're hitting our inflation targets. This is after 10 years of negative real interest rates. And I just note here, this is a, a, a bit of a hobby horse here, I guess, as Keynes himself predicted. People talk about these ultra-easy monetary policies as Keynesian policies. They are not Keynesian policies. They are Keynes of the treatise of 1931. When Keynes wrote the general theory, that long sort of intellectual path to get out of what he'd been thinking about before, he put into the general theory a wonderful quote, which is, if you are tempted to assume that money is the drink that stimulates the system to activity, you had best remember there are many slips twixt the cup and the lip. And then he goes on to basically say, all of the stuff that I recommended in the treatise, which in fact is what we're doing today, was not the right thing to do. Well, the second aspect of it, it doesn't work the way you thought it would work, is that it could lead to still more um, global imbalance, still more imbalances. 
and this goes back basically consistent with what Steve was talking about. Um, if you look at global debt ratios, which is the ratio of government, household, and corporate debt to global GDP, um, it is now 40 percentage points higher. It's gone from 192% to 232% of GDP at the end of 2017. So if you think the last 10 years, the post-crisis period, has been a period of deleveraging, think again. It's been the very opposite. And in a sense, even worse is that though prior to 2007, the emerging markets were sort of getting more and more involved in this thing, since 2007, the emerging markets have now become as much of a problem as they were part of the solution in 2007 and 2008. There's now, I think, something like $11 trillion, these are BIS numbers, there's $11 trillion worth of liabilities out there that are denominated in dollars that have been issued by people that don't earn dollars. Right? I'll come back to this in a second, this whole business about the swaps and where we stand in terms of global liquidity and the rest of it. Um, so there's a lot of mismatch problem out there, and um, we're starting to see some of the implications of this already in China. Uh, I would also contend that asset prices are, are, if not at unsustainable levels, certainly very, very richly priced. Uh, we have seen the price of equity in particular go up almost without, without stop uh, since 2010. Uh, I didn't buy into it, sadly, still having a central banker's mentality. I was at Jackson Hole when Ben Bernanke said, this is what we're going to do, and I totally missed it. There you have it. Um, but he, here we are again. I mean, the, the house prices, um, house prices, for example, I, I, in Canada, in Sweden, in all the Nordics, so many countries where house prices have not yet taken the hit. They're at unprecedented levels, along with unprecedented household debt levels relative to household income. Uh, the spreads, Pache, just October, where things have started to open up again. But the yield spreads, again, got very low. The VIX got very low. We had a lot of things to be concerned about. I think the risks of fa financial instability have risen because one of the unintended consequences of these very, very low interest rates and, and very easy financial conditions is that the insurance companies and the pension funds and the longer-term investors have not been able to make money with the traditional business model. They're now moving into sort of un, unconventional ways of making money to maintain the old business model. They're taking on more risks. That's got a lot of problems associated with it. Compounded by structural developments, um, affecting finance. We're all in our own silos, but you know the, the regulators should have been thinking about the fact that the banks have already got a problem with fintech. Right? Um, the pension funds and the insurance companies have already got a problem with you folks, to say nothing of myself, are living too long. Right? So we, we, all, we have all of these problems coming together, and and lastly, and this is something that I think needs more thought, is um, perhaps all of this financial stuff, this ultra-easy monetary policy, has actually been contributing to negative developments on the productivity side. And the BIS people have done a lot of work on this, looking at the composition of loans and the associated movements in real, uh, the real economy prior to the crisis. And one of the things that comes out of it is huge increases in housing, okay, construction, commercial property, retail. These are all areas that are traditionally low productivity. Okay? So, and then we have the crisis, and basically what's happened with the ultra-easy money, and again there's conference after conference on this now, is banks are so preoccupied because the fundamental problem was never resolved they're so busy trying to evergreen the old bad loans because they can't afford to take the hit that they're not in a position to give the money. I think it was, I can't remember, Steve or Michael. They're not in a position to give the money to young entrepreneurs, men and women in garages who have nothing but a good idea. So 
the whole thing is sort of, you can make a case, has been cutting, cutting out the, 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 the basis of economic growth. Now, there's a lot of people who say um, new regulations uh, are sufficient to ensure financial stability. So we can't, Janet, we can't have a repeat of 2008. Janet Yellen said, we will not see another one of these crises in my lifetime. Um, I, I would beg to differ. Uh, I haven't got enough time to go through it all. But what I would say is that when you look carefully at all the micro-prudential stuff that has been done, I am less than convinced that what has been done is adequate. And uh, there's, a, there's a line, well, Charles Goodhart, who's my first boss at the Bank of England, uh, he makes some very persuasive points about the analytical shortcomings of, of much of what has been done. But I, I'm also taken by a line from Lord Vickers, talking about the, you know, people say there's big, a big increase in capital requirements, and Lord Vickers' line was, 10 times better than hopelessly lax is not a useful measure. So I'm, I'm not so sure that the microprudential has ruled, tightening has ruled out future problems. And there has been a big, the silver bullet at the moment, right, is macroprudential policies. You hear everybody talking about macroprudential policies, which are policies that lean against systemic risk and recognize that risks can build up at certain times. Here's a fundamental point, I'll just stop with this. Those macroprudential policies were initially suggested by people at the Bank for International Settlements way back when, the Cook Committee, back in the late 1970s. The whole purpose was always that monetary policy and macroprudential policy would lean against the upturn of the credit cycle. And now what we're doing is the very opposite. We're using macroprudential tightening to allow ultra easy monetary policy to continue, to allow lower for longer. So the signs are the opposite of the effects of these things. And I put it to you that uh, that's not very helpful and that these unintended consequences I talked about earlier on are not adequately dealt with by these new regulations. Where do we go from here? Um, I mentioned demographics earlier on, uh, that um, the demographics were a positive supply side shock. The point I want to make is it's all going into reverse. So when you think about the really important real things underlying it, the real output line as it were in that, you know, for old timers, the IS line, but the output line, it's now going to be moving back in. The demographics are bad everywhere. Uh, you know it here in Germany and Switzerland. The working age population has been falling for ages in Japan. It's going down in China. So there's, there's all sorts of um, concerns about inflation just on that front. We have all of these rising imbalances that I just talked about that also say maybe you should tighten up to stop this from getting any worse. We see inflation is rising, just beginning, but it's, it's starting. So there's all sorts of reasons why one would say we should be tightening monetary policy. But this is the debt trap that we referred to before, is that we've let this go on for such a long period of time. The imbalances have built up to such a point that by tightening to prevent it from getting worse, you wind up being the trigger of the problems that you're trying to avoid. So we have this problem, as I refer to it, as the debt trap. When you look around the world, I'm not going to detail at this point, you look around the world, every major region has got big economic problems. Okay? Um, big economic problems, and it's matched by big political problems. Okay? So Schumpeter once famously said, what's the essence of economics? And Schumpeter said, politics, politics, politics. Every area you look at, think about Donald Trump. Think about unanimity for voting in Europe. Think about China and the role of the Communist Party. There's, there's a lot of big political issues out there. Um, and in the world that we live in, problems anywhere will become problems everywhere. Just think 2009, okay? Investment collapsed everywhere. Okay. A lot of countries looked at objectively had no problems, but investment collapsed everywhere. 
So, um, I think hoping that this time is different, um, well, as the phrase goes, hope is not a strategy. Uh, we should be preparing for, the, preparing for the worst, which is the next crisis. Um, and I think that really ought to be much higher on the, uh, on the agenda than it is at the moment, because I think we've got problems coming down the road. Well, uh, looking much forward, could improvements to the current system avoid future debt crises? Let's suppose we get through this thing somehow, for better or for worse. Let's start thinking now about the further future, so we're getting closer to questions of fundamental reform. Could, could, we, could we improve the current system enough to avoid future debt crises? Um, I think there are a number of things that could be done. For a starter, this coordinated resistance to lean against credit bubbles. I said the BIS sort of invented this 20, 30 years ago. Use both monetary policy and macro policy to lean against the credit bubble. We could try that. More symmetric use of fiscal and monetary policies. If we only sort of think fiscal, and fiscal in particular, if we only tightened up as much in the upturn as we ease these policies in the downturn, we wouldn't get the ratcheting up of debt and we wouldn't get the ratcheting down of interest rates. So we could think about that. Improving self-discipline. Um, 72 bankers went to jail after this crisis, of whom 41 were in Iceland. This compares to thousands of people who went to jail the last time. So maybe we could tighten up on self-discipline, market discipline. Uh, we could end interest deductibility. I'm starting to move on to structure now. You know, maybe a big part of our problem is interest deductibility. Another big part of it, limited liability banking. You know, the bankers go to excesses because they know that if they lose a lot of money, they got to put an option to the bondholders. Right? All that could be changed. All that could be changed within the context, basically, of the same structure. And then we could roll back the sort of things that have materially contributed to the problems, which is globalization, securitization, and, glo and consolidation. All of these things are possible. But then the question is, is all of that going to be sufficient? And I think there are very strong grounds for believing there might be, there might be difficulties come hell or high water, as they say, that it won't be adequate. And that's why it is really very important to start thinking about some of these other things. Uh, do we need a new monetary system? And I'll finish with this slide. Um, I will not profess to know enough. Uh, I think as our last speaker from the Riksbank pointed out, you know, to, to be able to say, we know everything there is to know so I can tell you what the next, the, the ideal revolutionary solution will be. I don't know enough. But what I can say is that there's a number of alternative suggestions that should be thought about in a very serious way. Uh, George Selgan has been on and on about free banking. Uh, the real problem is safety nets. Get rid of all of that stuff and the system will discipline itself. That's possible. Uh, Larry Kotlikoff, uh, let's rely on sort of mutual funds and 100% equity-based whatever. Larry's around. He'll, he'll make his own point this afternoon. We've had reference to the Chicago School, narrow banking. Uh, there again, one of the big problems with it is what they call the boundary problem. Other people create money, uh, things that look like money, so that narrow banking is not good enough. Uh, we've got Jonathan McMillan, whatever name he's going under at the moment, who's got an answer for that, which I think is a credible answer, but it's certainly one that we should be thinking about in the context of alternatives. So there's a lot of different things. And the last point that I'd make uh, is the international dimension. Uh, we do not have an international monetary system. We have an international monetary none system. There is no discipline arising from the center, from the IMF or rules or whatever, to prevent people from doing whatever they want. And the upshot of that is that every major central bank in the world now has a huge balance sheet which they have increased in the interests of what they consider to be their own domestic best interests, fair enough. 
But what nobody seems to be talking about is what are the implications of everybody doing that as we try to go out, as we try to get out of that system. So as we think about domestic monetary reform, we should not lose track of the fact we've got to think about international monetary reform as well. So I finish by saying there are prima facie grounds for thinking again. Uh, we are not in a good place. We should be thinking about how to get out of that place. What's your plan B? But as we start thinking forward, we should be giving these more radical suggestions some very serious consideration. Thank you. Would you be able to, or would you uh, be ready to answer some questions? I think we should I take... Have, there's not, there, I'm certainly prepared, but I know... I mean, given the, 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 the situation that you are here, I think we can take like five to ten minutes. Um, then we have to hurry up with the lunch, but I think it is worth it. So, um, please, quick questions, and if you have questions, please raise your arms now. Hi. Hello, my name is Stan Jordan from Prisdemony Europe. Uh, I really like your last point about the international dimension, uh, but I would agree that maybe the Eurozone is the most advanced experiment for an international money system, and therefore my question would be very simply, like, what would be your prescriptions for reforming the Eurozone? Thank you. <laughs> Good luck. Well, cer cer certainly the, um, the first thing one would say is that um, a definitive resolution of the debt issues in the banking system is an important thing to be thinking about. Uh, but looking forward, I guess I've always been of the view, I know there's a lot of opposition to this, I've, I've always been of the view that we need more Europe. That uh, there needs to be, if you're going to make the monetary thing work, uh, you need more integrated fiscal policy, you need more integrated uh, economic policy, structural reforms, and in the end, that's going to drive you in the direction of more political union. And I think that's what's needed. The problem with both Europe and the rest of the world is that as the problems become more and more international and more needful of cooperative efforts, the will of the guy in the street is moving absolutely in the opposite direction. And so, in the European case, for example, you know, one says we need more Europe, and the guy in the street is very likely to say, but we never asked for Europe in the first place. There wasn't a big debate about the Eurozone in particular. Right? So it's not just there. I mean, we're seeing this sort of populism, this nationalism, we're seeing it everywhere. So I think looking forward, as we talk about both crisis management and or sort of crisis resolution and crisis management, and then sort of looking forward to crisis prevention, we've got a real problem in that the political will to support that stuff is not there. And that's um, really a, a, an undesirable aspect of it. How can we, if you want to put it that way, the elites, get people back on board that what we're actually trying to do is in everybody's best interests? There's a real credibility gap. Thank you. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Mr. White, thank you very much for your enlightening analysis. Uh, my question is, why do you give so little consideration to the full money system? Well, I, I, think, I think when you say the full money system, you mean 100% reserve requirements? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the full money system what do you mean by that? Um, it is uh, to the system of sovereign money, so that not uh, that banks are not allowed to uh, to uh, to make money, but only the sovereign, in uh, in the shape of uh, of an own of the central bank. Well, maybe I I am misunderstanding you, but to me that seems the essence of. That seems the essence of the piece, and it goes back to Michael's, Michael's point about banks simply create money by writing up both sides of their balance sheet, and you really want to get to the fundamentals of the system, that's what you have to deal with. And the Chicago School's attempt was to 
Skogger School attempted to try to do that, but what one worries about increasingly in the modern world is the capacity of the financial system through innovation to create things that look just like money. So you think about shadow banking, for example, in the lead up to 2007. And the more you've got this problem with the, the, as Charles Goodhart calls it, the boundary problem, the less credible that initial proposal seems to me. And that's where the Jonathan uh, McMillan sort of more modern approach using FinTech to try to deal with some of those problems uh, might be coming into its own. Oh. Well, you were um, talking about the situation we're in and uh, um, um, what in your opinion um, is the role of the interest uh, that brought us oh. into this situation? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just started talking. Sorry. What's, what's in your opinion the role of the interest? Did it bring us into this situation or? The, the, the role of interest rates? Yeah, the interest itself. The existence of interest rates. Well, the existence of interest rates, I, I have to say, I haven't looked at it in quite that uh, um, profound a way, the existence of interest rates. But what I think I can say is that really since the early 1980s, uh, this constant reliance on uh, monetary easing to deal with whatever short-run problems of demand deficiency we faced, using that without at the same time having a symmetrical response in the good times has led to this ratcheting down of, of interest rates, both in nominal terms and in real terms. And I do think that that has contributed materially to the situation in which we find ourselves. It's, it's, as it were, I focus in my presentation on the lead up to the crisis and post-crisis. But you know, the honest truth is that when you go back to the uh, um, 1987 with the stock market crash, uh, the answer was lower the interest rates and keep them low for a while. And then we had exactly the same in 1990, 1996 in Southeast Asia, 1997 with LTCM, 2001, 2007. The point you want to take from this is it's all cumulative. So any of the damage that's being done is all cumulative. And um, the thing that has surprised me, I'll be honest, I talked a little bit earlier about my own personal investment mistakes, but um, the, 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 the reality is that um, the biggest mistake I've made, sort of at the analytical level, was failing to see how adeptly the central bankers using the instruments that they had at hand could actually get the economy out of the problem that it was in at that particular moment, whether it was 87, 90, 95, 96, whatever. But I just repeat that all the time, those successes carry within them the sort of the, 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 the nut of the heart of the problem going forward, which is the big increase in debt and all of the other imbalances associated with that credit expansion. Please let me ask one more last question, Martin, please. <laughs> um, we from Monitor TV several times um, tried to talk to politicians in Germany. And it was quite frustrating. I can't say you one single politician in Germany who is interested in even discussions about uh, systemic change in monetary systems. But to have this change, um, you need politics. So perhaps you as a prominent economist in a much better position, um, perhaps you have, could you name me uh, one politician who is really <laughs> interested or did you discuss, what's your experiences of discussions with politicians? Uh, I, I had a couple of slides which I didn't get to actually that address directly this question. Uh, we need a quote unquote, a paradigm shift, right? in terms of thinking about all of these issues. We need different domestic monetary systems. We need a new international monetary system. We need a paradigm shift. Uh, Steve was going on quite eloquently about how we could possibly believe some of the stuff that many academics do apparently believe. Uh, we need a paradigm shift. But what we know from history, and I mean, if you go back and you read Thomas Kuhn, for example, you know, the structure of scientific revolutions, 
these paradigm shifts are enormously difficult to 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 what's the word to to um, to get even in normal times. Okay, Copernicus was on his deathbed before he let them before he let them publish his book. Okay, Charles Darwin sat on the theory of evolution for ten years until a younger colleague said, I'm going to publish. And then he said, oh, okay, I'll go along with it. The, the, the concern about what the establishment would say is, is huge. So it's difficult enough, even in normal times, to get people to think about the unthinkable. And when you get into really difficult times, and this is Daniel Kahneman, you know, who wrote, who won the Nobel Prize, what, in 2004 or something like that. Uh, he's a psychologist. And he wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And Daniel Kahneman says that when you are totally confronted with a situation that just couldn't happen, okay, like DSG models, there's no room in those models for crises of the sort that we've had, okay? When you're confronted with those kinds of shocks, you would think people would say, I've got to re-examine the fundamental principles on which my whole belief system is based. People don't do that. They do the very opposite, according to Dan Kahneman. You know, they retreat into what they, the phrase goes, if you don't know what to do, do what you know. Right? So you, you, you retreat into what you, your fundamental beliefs. And I tend to think, <laughs> this is actually what's happened in recent years, because since the crisis, the Germans have retreated into what's the fundamental problem? And the fundamental problem, of course, is excessive debt the need for debt reduction, the need for austerity, it's Weimar time all over again. And the Americans is the very opposite. They've retreated into, if we're not very careful, it's the Great Depression all over again. So you can sort of see this sort of simple insight of Dan Kahneman almost playing out in front of your eyes. My only point is, it's very hard to get these changes, and it's even harder when the chips are down. And I'm hoping, and I, I, I don't know, if we do run into another big problem, I hope this will be the catalyst for people treating seriously the kind of topic that you're treating seriously here today. But there's absolutely no guarantee. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Pleasure.